Greetings, and welcome to today's MIT STAR Forum on the Rise and Fall of the East, How Exams, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology Brought China Success, and Why They Might Lead to Its Decline. I'm Michelle English, and I'm delighted that you were able to join us for what will be an amazing discussion. The title of our event is taken from our keynote speaker, Professor Yaxing Huang's book that was published in 2023 by Yale University Press. Among the many glowing reviews, it was selected as a best book of the year in 2023 by Foreign Affairs Magazine. We're honored to have him with us today to share his expertise on China and thrilled that he is being joined by Will Knight as a discussant. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the MIT Center for International Studies, the MIT China Program, and the MIT COOP, who are the sponsors of today's event. The MIT COOP is here and offering a discount on Professor Wang's book. If you haven't picked one up yet, please do. We will have time at the end of our talk for a book signing right up here on stage. I also want to mention that at the end of the event, as usual, we will have time for Q&A with, with you. And for that, line up behind the mics. And please, um, just for sake of time, ask only one question. Finally, if you haven't already, please consider signing up to receive our Star Forum event notices. We offer many events throughout the academic year, both in person and hybrid, and we feature leading scholars on ex and experts on today's most pressing global issues. And now let me introduce you to our speakers. Professor Yaxing Huang holds the Epic Foundation Professorship of Global Economics and Management at the MIT Sloan School of Management. During this academic year, he is serving as a visiting fellow at the Kissinger Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center in DC. He has served as an associate dean in charge of MIT Sloan's global partnership programs and its action learning initiatives. His previous appointments include faculty positions at the University of Michigan and at Harvard Business School. He's the author of 11 books in both English and Chinese and of numerous academic papers. He's also received multiple prestigious fellowships and has worked on several policy projects related to US-China relations. He was one of the co-authors of MIT's report, University Engagement with China and MIT Approach. And he is a co-chair of an implementation committee of that report. At the Center for International Studies, he serves as the faculty director of the MIT China program. This program combines student coursework on China and the Chinese language with hands-on applications in industry research and educational technology for our students. Um, in addition, he is a part of a new program that will be officially launched in the fall that is housed at the Center for International Studies as well, called the MIT China Policy Program. Um, there's a lot more to say about Professor Huang, but I'll end here and let you look at his online bio for more details. Um, also, as I shared early, earlier, we're truly honored that Will Knight is joining the talk as a discussant. Mr. Knight is a senior writer for Wired, where he covers artificial intelligence. He also writes their Fast Forward newsletter that explores how advances in AI and other emerging technology are set to change our lives. And you can sign up for his newsletter by going to his Wired bio, and it'll come straight to your inbox, I think on a weekly basis. Every, OK. Um, he was previously a senior editor at MIT Technology Review, where he wrote about fundamental advances in AI and China's AI boom. Before that, he was an editor and writer at New Scientist. He studied anthropology and journalism in the UK before turning his attention to machines and making his home here in the Cambridge area. I'd like to ask you to please join me now in welcoming Professor Huang to the podium. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, and thank you also for organizing this uh, book talk. I'm very happy to, uh, to be here. And so let me just talk a little bit about this new uh, program we're going to launch at uh, MIT. One of the recommendations in the MIT's report on engaging with China, uh, how to engage with China in this new era, 
One of the recommendations is increasing social science investments in China, acquiring more knowledge about the country, about the economy, about the politics, about the society. And MIT, as many of you know, is on the forefront of technology, engineering, and, and science. Unfortunately, it has also been on the forefront of the attention from the US government on relationship with China. So the report is not just a defensive report. It is a proactive report arguing very strongly for the case of making a knowledge investment in the country. So we're going to do this in the fall. We're going to launch the program in the fall. And we look forward to engagements with you and participation from uh, MIT and from uh, the greater Boston area. So, but today uh, I want to talk about my, my, my book. Uh, there are copies out there uh, for sale. Uh, please buy the book, whether you read it or not, I don't care, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but buy it. Um, so the book, um, the, the title uh, East, uh, as Michelle pointed out, stands for exam, autocracy, uh, stability, and technology. So it is not just a geographic reference, although it is a geographic reference, it is about China. Fundamentally, it is about these four organizing forces that have shaped Chinese economy, Chinese politics, and Chinese uh, society for thousands of years. But I'm not trained as a historian, so I'm not qualified to really go very deeply into Chinese uh, history. So instead, uh, instead of focusing on, on one dynasty or two dynasties, a, a non-historical approach is to focus on all of them. And, and, and so we, we build a data uh, base on uh, historical inventions in Chinese history. And that was a collaborative project with Tsinghua University. It took us six years. It took uh, the investment of uh, some 44 researchers at Tsinghua University. And now we have a database spanning from 5th century BCE all the way to 19th century CE. And the pattern of the Chinese technological development historically is extraordinarily interesting. And we didn't really anticipate to see the patterns that emerged from the analysis. And the pattern, simply put, is the following. And, and many of you may know that China was once one of the most inventive civilizations in the world. China invented the big fours, uh, the compass, uh, gunpowder, printing, and paper. In addition to these uh, big fours, China invented uh, irrigation techniques, terracing techniques, uh, iron making, um, and many, many other inventions, and also discoveries of natural a phenomena, a phenomen, phenomena well ahead of the Europeans. But then all this inventiveness suddenly disappeared. By one account, it disappeared in 17th century. And this is according to Joseph uh, Neaton, who compiled 27 volumes on Chinese uh, civilization and, uh, and uh, uh, science. So we use his volumes to compile our database. It turns out that Joseph Needham, although he was a scientist by training, never looked at his own materials statistically. Our data analysis shows that Chinese inventiveness declined as early as 6th century rather than 17th century. And then what happened in the 6th century? The first letter of my book, title happened, the exam. In, 50, uh, in 587, the Sui Dynasty uh, established the civil service examination system. In Chinese, it's called Keju. And then it took the exam system uh, a few centuries, about three centuries, to, um, to essentially to go into its normal 
and permanent uh, equilibrium operation, uh, equilibrium of the operation. By about 12th century, only one ideology was tested on the exam, and that was Confucianism. It was a special, specific form of Confucianism known as a Neo-Confucianism, very rigid, very narrowly defined version of a broader Confucianism um, uh, invented by Confucius himself. So this is a new Confucianism invented by a Zhu Xi, a philosopher of the Song dynasty. So essentially by 12th century, uh, China only had one ideology left. Now I'll go back to the technology, technological database. What we showed is that the Chinese technology began to decline for the first time in the sixth century when China invented the Keju system. I would argue it was not the Keju system per se that resulted in the decline of Chinese inventiveness. It was really the reunification of China into one single empire by the Sui dynasty in 580 CE. Many of you know that uh, China was a unified empire in 221 BCE by the Qing dynasty, the Terracotta, and, and all of that. But then China dissolved into competing, um, uh, competing kingdoms in 220 CE. So there were a period of 360 years when China was fragmented, fractured politically, uh, uh, territorially, and it turned out ideologically. It was during that era Chinese inventiveness reached its peak. So in my book, I called that era the Chinese European moment. And essentially, it was like Europe after the collapse of Roman Empire in 467 CE. And there's a famous book by Walter Schedel at Stanford University. The title of the book is Escape from Rome. And the central argument of that book is that the reason why Europe invented technology, science, and GDP, and medicine, and all of that, intellectual property rights, democracy, rule of law, essentially it was because Europe was never able to return to the unified empire of Roman Empire. Right? Many people tried. Napoleon tried. Hitler tried. Um, Putin is trying his, his best, but they all failed, right? So Europe remained fragmented. It was that fragmentation that gave rise to inventiveness and technological uh, innovations. China actually had that moment between 220 and 580, and China also had that moment before the Qing uh, Kingdom unified China for the first time in 221 BCE. So in our database, what we are able to show is that there were two peaks of Chinese technology. One was before the Qing Kingdom unified China in 221 BCE. And the second time was during this European moment between 220 and 580. And then there was another dip by about 12th and 13th century. And this time, it was a result of ideological unification when the Keju exam succeeded in get, getting rid of every single other ideology, and there was only one narrow ideology left. So I'm using the history of China to look at China today. So the, the book is a little bit unusual because it covers both history and today. And it doesn't do it in a chronological order, it does it by topical order. So I talk about exam first in the Sui dynasty, and then I talk about the meritocracy under the Chinese Communist Party. Autocracy and how the exam system contributed to the imperial autocracy, and then I talk about the autocracy uh, today in China. And then the, um, the, the technology piece, um, I also have one chapter on historical technology, and this is the, the next chapter, chapter eight, is on technology today, and I look forward to the discussion with Will on, on that. And the central argument about why China was able to achieve scientific, 
technological and entrepreneurial success, despite the fact it remained a one-party, single autocratic system. The reason for that was, was because China embraced globalize, globalization. Globalization, typically we think about in economic terms, foreign capital, foreign trade, business uh, interactions. But in my book, I emphasize globalization of human capital, academic changes between American universities, European universities, and Chinese universities. And also in my book, I emphasize the role of Hong Kong when Hong Kong enjoyed one country, two systems privilege of having a separate economic, political, and legal system from the rest of China. It had rule of law, it had uh, freedom of uh, press and speech uh, before 2019 when uh, Hong Kong enacted the national security law. And the Chinese entrepreneurs, if you examine the registry books of many Chinese high-tech entrepreneurial startups, many of them register their assets in Hong Kong to access the legal protection provided by Hong Kong. So you're going to hear arguments from other academics who say that rule of law doesn't matter for China because China itself doesn't have rule of law. Uh, I'm not going to say they are wrong. I'm going to say they are completely wrong. Hong Kong offers the rule of law in a way that mainland China does not. Academic globalization works exactly the same way. When a Chinese university professor comes to MIT, he or she enjoys the same academic freedom as I do now, as everybody here in the room now. So essentially, it was a borrowed academic freedom. It was an outsourced academic freedom. And that was critical toward Chinese uh, academic and uh, scientific uh, success. So, so that framework does not violate what we call primitive economic laws, which say that we need competition, we need basic protection of uh, speech, we need basic protection of uh, assets. But the places to look for those functions are not in the usual places, such as residing within the country itself. They reside elsewhere. The last two chapters are about the future. So I worry about the future in the following sense, that academic collaboration is not operating at the same level. And we can debate about who is the, to blame for, for that. But the simple fact is that academic collaboration has slowed down tremendously. Economic collaboration has also, has also um, suffered, uh, whether or not there's a debate, whether or not there is a clean decoupling. But I think the trend is quite clear if we think about this issue counterfactually, which is that uh, without, without the political, geopolitical complications, the trade between the two countries would have grown at a higher level than it has, it has done uh, so far. Cultural uh, collaboration has uh, decreased. Uh, as we speak now, there are about 350 students from America in China, only 350, right? Um, so across the board, the two countries have gone their separate ways. And China now has a very ambitious uh, industrial policy to replicate the entire semiconductor supply chain. You know, there are probably experts in the room who know this uh, more than I do. You know, even if you can achieve the engineering replication, the economic costs of doing that are going to be tremendous. And uh, because essentially you're using resources to do something that TSMC and others have done to replicate what they have done. And rather than using those economic resources for other programs and for other uh, worthy objectives, such as investing in the rural area, such as investing in education and public health. And the other thing that I see as a headwind is the fact that 
Chinese GDP is uh, slowing down. The official number is that uh, last year, the GDP grew only by 5.4%. Uh, that number is questioned by many, many people. But let's just say that's a true number. That's a very, very sharp reduction from the prevailing 8 9% a year for the pre prior 40 years. And many people sort of make the mistake in, in thinking that Chinese industrial policy created Chinese economic success. The truth is exactly the opposite. The Chinese economic success created Chinese industrial policy because industrial policy is extremely costly. When you fund a costly program, you need very high level of economic growth in order to fund that program. A lot of the things they're doing today are essentially increasing the cost of the economy rather than providing immediate rewards and, and the benefits. The rewards and benefits may happen in the future, but immediately it is a cost rather than a revenue. So you know, I'd be happy to hear a more optimistic uh, scenario, but that's where I, I, um, I conclude my, my book. And I believe that, um, that academic, economic, and many other collaborations between China and the West is a critical component to Chinese economic success. And my worry is that the leaders in China today discount the value of globalization. They believe that their GDP is second largest in the world. They can do lots of, the, lots of these things on their own. I don't believe that. I believe that, um, that lots of the successes they have achieved are a result of collaboration. Let me end there, and I look forward to a conversation. Um, first of all, thank you, Michelle, for inviting me. I, I want to preface this so I'm not, I'm very far from a China expert, but I, I've, I've read a fair few books on China, and I have to say I think this is probably my favorite. It, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So I, I recommend not only buying it, but reading it as well. <laughs> I think that would be a, my, my, uh, my suggestion. So, um, and, uh, you know, the history is, is absolutely, is really fascinating. You say you're not qualified as a historian, but it really is it, it very compelling and, and, and very interesting. But um, to sort of bring us to the present, you know, my experience going to, to China and meeting entrepreneurs there in the past decade or so, um, it feels like I've met incredibly, you know, entrepreneurial, creative, inventive people. And the narrative you hear, especially from, you know, people who, who want to kind of maybe have got sort of vested interests um, is that China is incredibly competitive and maybe even a threat to the US. So can you unpack a bit how how we got to that? How how it is that that's the that's the perception currently? The, the perception that China is, is a threat. Is, is a threat is incredibly, you know, technologically even overtaking the US, but whereas maybe it isn't. Yeah, so, so I don't believe China is technologically overtaking the US, but that's how some people perceive the, the country, and so the perception drives the policy. I live in DC now, and, and you hear the view very often that, um, that China not only has the capability to challenge the US, uh, it also has the, uh, the, the, the intention and the willingness to challenge the US. I think the capability part, we can, we can, we can have a debate I don't have such a dark view of the Chinese intentions, right? So to, to, to argue that now we're entering into another Cold War, to believe in that narrative, you have to believe in the following, which is that China is similar to Soviet Union. But look at what Soviet Union did during the Cold War, right? In 1961, Soviet Union at least gave the authorization to East Germany to build the uh, Berlin Wall, uh, separating West Berlin from, uh, from, uh, from, from, uh, from West Germany, triggering the airlift that almost led to uh, the, the Third World War. 
And then in uh, 1962, it, it tried to ship missiles to Cuba, and then the blockade uh, almost threatened the world with a nuclear uh, annihilation for 13 days, right? So in 96, uh, okay, I forgot one other event. In 1956, Soviet Union invaded Hungary, crushing the reforms there. In 68, it invaded Czechoslovakia. In 79, it invaded Afghanistan. No matter what you say about Xi Jinping and the domestic autocracy and economic controls and all of that, China hasn't done anything even remotely close to that, right? So yes, Taiwan and South China Sea, we can we can we can have a, a discussion uh, about that. So I'm very uncomfortable with the view that that China has the intention; it may have the capability. Uh, it has a large navy, it has many many soldiers. And I'm not a military expert, but it looks like China has a strong military. But what matters is the intentions. I, I don't think China has that. I think China now is facing a very challenging domestic economic situation. And it is not the time to, it, it's not the time, nor is it any optimal time to think about geopolitical intentions, geopolitical ambitions. Right. Well, um and make, can you maybe explain it also a little bit about how the the reform? So you you know you have this pi yeah. picture of of, of um, China for a long time not be you know being kind of constrained by this 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 sort of adherence to yeah. But so so can you explain what happened with um, with the um, you know the reforms that, that that happened and how maybe that's reversing as well? Yeah. So 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 if we go back to 1978. Um, I think everybody in this room would know that China launched economic reforms. Right. Not everybody in this room probably knows that China also launched legitimate political reforms. And then 1989 happened, right? Tiananmen happened. The leadership after Tiananmen continued with certain portions of economic reforms. Mm -hmm. They reversed one of the most consequential reforms uh, launched by the leaders in the 1980s, which was financial reforms, rural financial reforms. They, re they reversed all of that. They recentralized the banking system. They recentralized the tax system. That recentralization had an enormous impact on rural China. And by the way, in the early 1990s, Rural China accounted for 80% of the Chinese population. So the income slowed down, and then the entrepreneurial activity slowed down in the, in the rural part of the country. But what the leadership in the 1990s, I call them Shanghai, Shanghai technocrats. Mm -hmm. And I was born in Beijing, so I never really <laughs> have a very favorable view of, of Shanghai. And, and so, but that's a separate issue. The, so they, they essentially came and dominated Chinese politics. Mm -hmm. And they impose what I call in my book the Shanghai model. What is Shanghai model? Shanghai model is using the power of the government to develop the cities, urbanization, industrial policy, technical nationalism. And the key component of that is um, globalization. So, mm. so the 1990s, China was very aggressive in pushing globalization agenda, which economically speaking, compensated for the rural situation, the rural stagnation. And then what you see is this massive migration of rural labor to the urban areas because the globalization brought about essentially economic opportunities in the urban areas. And the rural areas were uh, deprived of access to finance. And, and so the labor began to move. The labor, they have legs, so they began to move. So rather than economic opportunities is moving, it was the labor that moved. That, that, was a, that was a, you could say that was an achievement in the 1990s. You could also say it, it was a reflection of the difficulties of um, China in the 1990s. And then the two other leadership 
teams came in, one in 2002 and the other one in 2012. Uh, so I, I forgot to mention another thing. Um, so the leadership in after Tiananmen reversed all the political reforms, right. every single one of them. Right? Um, and they re-centralized the political system. Uh, many people in this room may not know that China in the 1980s um, was actually governed in a fragmented manner. The presidency was held by one person. The party secretary was held by another person. The uh, military, the head of the military was, was a third person. The premier was the fourth, fourth person. And there was another powerful organization called the Central Advisory Commission. That was the fifth person. In after Tiananmen, they combined the presidency with the party secretary and the military. So that's one person. Okay. And then the premier, that's the second person. And then they abolished the Central Advisory Commission. So essentially, China politically moved from a five power system to a two power system. And then in 2002, the leadership came in. They had some good intentions. They really want to improve the rural situation. They got rid of the taxation of the, of the rural uh, residents. Uh, they also supported rural education. And by the way, um, after you finish my book, you should go and buy another book. It's called The Invisible China okay. uh, by Scott Rizal. It is one of the best books about rural China and about the human capital deficiency of rural China. And that was all a result of the 1990s mm. bias toward the urban areas at the expense of the rural areas. They didn't invest in rural education. And then 2008 happened. The financial crisis happened. So then Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao responded to the financial crisis by launching this massive infrastructure program. Mm. The real estate program, the infrastructure program. Essentially, Chinese economy today is suffering from the aftermath of that, right. of that program. And then Xi Jinping came in in 2012. So Xi Jinping reversed. So the previous leaders reversed political reforms, a lot of them. But there were two important reforms enacted by Deng Xiaoping that didn't reverse. One was the term limit. Right. Right. And the other was the mandatory age requirement. Mm -hmm. So essentially, what happened was in the 1990s, the leadership reversed all these kind of smaller political reforms. But then they left in place the mandatory uh, retirement and then the term limit. And that's why they stepped down. Right. Right? And Xi Jinping reversed those two. Right? So essentially, every single meaningful reform, political reform that happened in China happened in the 1980s by about 2018, every single one of them was, was gone. Did, did some of those reforms, or many of them, enable some of the economic growth, the innovation that you saw exactly. in the country? Yeah. Right. So, so I was talking about this Chinese-European moment uh, in the third century, fourth century, uh, CE, fragmentation, competition. So if you trace a lot of these early economic reforms, they happened precisely because the leadership was divided. Mm. So it is very interesting that there is this strong belief on the part of many Western ac academics. The belief is that you need a strong leader to implement reforms. The evidence is exactly the opposite. OK, so if you look at two strongest leaders in the PRC history, mm -hmm. one is Mao. Did he, right. <laughs> did he undertake any economic reforms? No, he didn't. The other is Xi Jinping. Did he undertake any meaningful economic reforms? Not only he didn't do that, he reversed yeah. economic reforms. It was actually the situation in between which gave the space and the room for experimentation for local initiatives. And so that's how uh, the special economic zones happened. This is how the rural contracting system happened. This is how the rural financial liberalization happened. It was not directed by a wise autocrat. Right. It was actually a result of these local, extremely smart, ambitious local uh, officials and uh, entrepreneurs 
it was a result of that local initiative. But you hear the narrative all the time. You need an autocracy to right. uh, implement economic reforms. The evidence is exactly the opposite. Well, and speaking of what's happening now, um, you know, we can maybe talk a bit about the, the crackdown on corruption leading into yeah. this. But you, you're seeing a lot of um, quite remarkable um, crackdowns on, say, the tech industry, which I, I follow, yeah. which seem almost um, you know, self-destructive in some ways. Yeah, so, um, so there's anti-corruption. Um, and then in 2021, 2022, they began to crack down on these high-tech uh, companies, uh, the gaming industry, the ride-hailing industry, a company, uh, Alibaba, and financial, mm -hmm. and also the social media uh, platforms. So we think that it is destructive. It is very interesting in my many, many conversations with Chinese political people, um, and this is not Xi Jinping level, this is much lower level. They actually don't believe it was the private sector that gave the China the economic success. Well, okay. And I, I remember vividly, I was talking to a banker in Shanghai and, and I said, shouldn't you pay attention to the private entrepreneurs? Uh, he said, why? He said, well, it's the private entrepreneurs that created the jobs and technology. And then he said something that, that, that was very interesting. Yeah, he said they did that, but I gave them the capital. Mm. Right. I mean, technically speaking, he was correct. Right. Right. I didn't, I was too polite to remind him that he also gave capital to a lot of the <laughs> SOEs that failed miserably. Right. And, uh, and then the, despite that uh, uh, losses, that uh, he came out ahead precisely because the private entrepreneurs were so much more efficient than the state-owned uh, enterprises. So it is very interesting that many Chinese political elites don't actually believe that the economic growth was a result of private sector. They may have a social rationale. They created jobs, mm. right? They created employment. Um, many of them don't believe that. Uh, they, they, they don't believe that they, they can pay. I mean, until they do, right? So once they crack down, then they see the effects. Why, why is that? Why do they not? Do I, that, do you think? I, yeah, so it's, it's really remarkable. If you read the official literature on, on this topic, the official literature is always talking about the leadership role of the government. The leadership role, just like that banker, right? So, you know, he worked for a state-owned bank. And you know, first of all, I told him that the reason why he has so much power is because the government doesn't allow private entrepreneurs right. to enter into financial sector, right? There's no, there's no, there's no God-given reason why he is uniquely capable of providing that uh, financial service. So a lot of it is regulatory restriction. Um, and they, in, in that sort of environment, in that ideological environment, in that narrative environment, they are not exposed to different points of views. The, they censor the media. Um, and, you know, before Xi Jinping, the social media was relatively free. So at least people like myself and others could write about these issues. I don't know how, how, how influential they were with the, with the leaders. But in their own little world, that's not the information they get right. exposed to. And what, what do you ascribe the crackdown to? I mean, the, is that part of this, this sort of, you know, the corruption, self, you know, self-fulfilling yeah. vicious cycle? Or is it, is it also sort of adjusting to the fact that there weren't very many regulations? What, what happened? Yeah, so the regulation, I mean, um, so, so you could make a regulatory argument for, for, the, for some of the things that they have done. One of the arguments they invoked is uh, anti-monopoly. But the inconvenient fact is that let the state-owned monopolies do whatever they, they wanted to do. So everything they went after was a private sector mm, play. Right. So, so essentially, the ownership bias is straightforward. There's an ownership bias in the crackdown. So this is not a regulation in the way we think about regulation. We should think about regulation as treating every company 
equally, and, and, and then depending on the act committed by the company, then we go after them. So um, we don't really know why he did it, um, and, and only he knew. Um, and, you know, so we, we, we don't really have good, uh, uh, good information. I don't believe in a, in a, in a narrative I, I can say what I don't believe. I, I don't really know what I believe. What I don't believe is, is the view, oh, the Chinese private sector was so strong that they began to threaten mm. the right. Chinese That's... Communist Party. So in 2012, Xi Jinping made a speech about the collapse of Soviet Union. And in that speech, he said that Soviet Union collapsed because Soviet Union didn't have strong government control political control and ideological control. I don't think that's the right diagnosis of why Soviet Union collapsed. Right. I mean, Soviet Union collapsed because Soviet Union didn't have entrepreneurship, didn't have GDP growth, right. and didn't have this vibrant uh, economic uh, development. China had all of those things. And, and Chinese Communist Party should write a letter of gratitude to the private sector every day, mm. thanking them for working so hard to keep the regime in power, right? right? So that would be the right way to treat the private sector. But if you come with the view that the control is the key mechanism, yeah. right? You implicitly discount this resource view, right? You emphasize the control view. Then you behave according to that particular point of view. Well, look at China now. They don't have the kind of GDP growth that they have now. And in the last chapter of my book, I predicted the rise of, you know, not high level political instabilities, but maybe probably low level political instabilities. Now some regional governments have difficulties paying the salaries of the regional officials. Mm. I mean, how do you maintain political stability when you have difficulties keeping your own people happy, right? So, so it's a, it's a, a lot of it is, it's very interesting. It's, you know, it's, it's the point of view that you have r rather than objective facts that you have that determine the policy. And, and in, in that environment where you don't have freedom of speech, the views that I just expressed do not get propagated, right. right? So essentially people don't, know about about that and and so so in the end i come down to the view that um you know i'm i'm not a blind believer in democracy uh, democracy has a lot of problems i'm working on a book on uh, on that now uh, but i believe that if you look at autocracies that have succeeded they tend to be autocracies with quite a degree of freedom right. and autonomy Deng Xiaoping's autocracy in the 1980s, and maybe a little bit in the 1990s, South Korea in the 1960s and 1970s, Taiwan in the 60s and 70s. The extreme autocracy doesn't succeed. Mm -hmm. North Korea didn't succeed, doesn't succeed. Mao China didn't uh, succeed, right? So autocracy, you can find successful autocr autocratic examples, but they tend to be soft autocracies, mm. not hardcore uh, autocracies. Would you, do you have any hope that that could, could change naturally as a result of you know, yeah. the, the mm. situation that's emerging? So uh, in one chapter, I talk about the incentive problem of autocrats. Right, right. And, and you don't want to step down. And so, so this is where, where, now I have to say, I, I gained enormous amount of respect for Deng Xiaoping mm -hmm. as a result of writing this book. I, you know, I, I respected him before, but I respect him even more now. This age requirement uh, and this term limitation is a way for autocrats to step, to step yeah, away. Right. And that, that is actually not a simple thing. It moderates your behavior. Imagine in 10 years, I'm thinking about stepping down. Right. Then my incentive is not to offend so many people. 
You talk about the predecessors having a very predecessor. Yeah. So right. you, you you need to keep because in ten years you know you you you're going to become a predecessor. Yeah. Right. Right. So you don't want to antagonize your own predecessor yeah. to set up a bad example. So essentially, what I call gentle politics. You have gentle politics, right? So you treat uh, uh, politics as competition rather than struggle, and and that introduces moderation. When you have moderation, then you have moderate policies. You tend not to go extreme. Previous uh, leaders also committed some mistakes. I'm reading a book about. Uh, um, pandemic. Now, you know, in 2003, they had um, SARS um, uh, epidemic, and uh, but then they learned. They set up the the system. You know, Hu Jintao was was not as strong as as、uh, Xi Jinping. Did the current government learn anything from、okay. Wuhan? I don't see any evidence of it. Right. So, so and now you don't step down, and that gives you. License to do things that you don't have when you have to think about stepping down. Right. Right. One thing I, I found myself wondering, reading the last chapter about where China is now, is how U.S. and Western policy、yeah. plays into that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and obviously there's, there's a. I mean, at the moment we've got very hawkish attitudes. I mean, incredibly, in Washington, and I wonder if that is, you know, playing into this. More autocratic scene there. Yeah. So the hawkish、uh, attitude,、uh, you know, TikTok and and all of that.、Um, I propose in the last chapter a different way of dealing with China. I recognize the geopolitical complications, the economic complications, and the political complications of U.S.-China relationship. Right. So there's no. I'm not naive,、um, but I just don't think that. Our approach has been the productive one. The previous approach was what is known as engagement,、mm. engaging with China economically, and then China will change politically. You know, how do you expect a country with two thousand years of <laughs> exam system and all of that to change so easily, right?、Mm. And that policy was created by the uh, George. Um, Uh, George,、uh, the older Bush, the this Bush senior, Bush senior, and then by Clinton, in the aftermath of democratization of South Korea and、uh, Taiwan. Right, right. So they thought that China was going to repeat that, but the fundamental difference between South Korea and Taiwan, you know, size is one thing, but the fundamental difference is that U.S. always had political engagement with Taiwan with South Korea. Right. Right. Uh, the Korean Constitution was written by a Harvard political scientist, and、uh, Taiwan, you know, before the diplomatic relationship with China, there were very intimate political interactions. Whereas the economic relationship between China and the U.S. was primarily economic,、uh, education for sure, students and scholars, but the political engagement was very limited. Right, so you can't really expect. These sort of economic and academic exchanges, good as they were for other things, to change the politics. Right, right. And now we go from that extreme to a another extreme, which is that everything that China does is a、uh, threat to the national security interests、mm -hmm. of the United States.、Mm -hmm. So what I propose in my book is that we ought to have a more measured. View measured view of China, but also to give the other side the option, right? For example, I would argue for TikTok. You know, rather than banning TikTok, what we could say to the Chinese government is that you know, okay, how about we wait for six months? You allow Google to come in, right? You allow Facebook to come in, right? right? And then you know, TikTok can stay. Confucius Institute, same thing, right? So、I、MIT、know. never established the Confucius Institute, but many other universities established Confucius Institute. First of all, they abolished the Confucius Institute because Confucius Institute advocated communist ideology.、Mm. Are we so intellectually diffident about liberal democracy that we don't want them to advocate communism? I, no, I have no、right. fear of. Communism as, <laughs> communism as an ideology. I can debate 
Yeah. Where the companies, anytime I, 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 uh, he or she uh, is willing to. So what we can say is that, okay, let's do this in, uh, for six months. We keep the Confucius Institute. But may, maybe Peking University should establish a Jeffersonian whatever <laughs> right. institute, right? Yeah. Um, oh, MIT Institute, whatever, right? So I, I think I would do that, right? In the end, you may come back and abolish the Confucius Institute because the other side may not agree. But at least you gave the other side the option. And, and, and that has less risk of playing into the hardline rhetoric in China, which is that United States is there to get at China, to, destroy, yeah. to get at Chinese people, to get at Chinese economy, right? Because we don't like China to be the second largest GDP or even the biggest GDP in the world. I don't believe that's the motivation, but I believe the way we conduct our foreign policy conveys that impression. Mm. And, the, and the relationship has been so beneficial to the US as well. Absolutely, for such a long time. absolutely. And this is really one of the, there's now a revisionist history yeah. of globalization about US-China relations. I blame lots of things on the US for not using the dividends from globalization with China. For example, one of the uh, benefits was access to cheap capital, right? China funded the US uh, budgetary deficit right. by investing very heavily in the US Treasury bond, lowering the interest rates, which benefited American households, American corporations, uh, and, uh, and many, many others. What did we do with that dividend? We didn't invest in manufacturing, we didn't do right. any of those things. Right. We reduce the tax rates on the rich people, right? And allowing the 1% to get away with all this uh, capital. We didn't really improve the social security system. We didn't improve the healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. So in my current book, I, I go through lots of these things. Okay. And so, you know, to be sure, Chinese manufacturing has resulted in job losses Right, but that's kind of, you know, almost, you know, I'm not going to say natural, but I'm just going to say it's kind of a law of economic gravity, right? right? right. So the, the, the activities tend to migrate. The right way to think about this is not to stop globalization, but to strengthen the, the, the protection so that the risks of globalization do not fall so disproportionately on, right. On, on certain vulnerable population. And we didn't do that, mm, right? right? And now we're playing all these things on, 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 on China without recognizing the benefits that have come from uh, economic interactions with China. Scientifically, right, technologically, right. there's a lot of benefits. Yeah, I, I, I'm conscious that people have been queuing to, to ask questions, I think, yeah. from the start. Or well, maybe not, maybe they're just sitting there. If you do yeah. have questions, so do you want to? Go to, to a microphone. Are you waiting to ask a question? No, or are you just sitting there? <laughs> okay. Um, well, if, you, if anybody does have a question, you can also raise your hand. I think we can get a microphone to you. Um, this gentleman here, actually, or, or actually, I think. Okay. Sorry, get to the mic. Hi. Go ahead. So I have an impossible a question that's impossible to answer, <laughs> and that is in. Are you going to ask anyway? Yeah. <laughs> in 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 Chao Ziying's autobiography, he discusses a debate that he had with uh, with Deng about him uh, Chao feeling that China at this at, in the late eighties was at an inflection point where it could either go to a Western you know rule of law democracy direction or it would have to revert to more autocracy to survive. Um, and so I, I guess the question is, do, do you agree with that evaluation? And what do you think might have happened had, uh, had Chao's view prevailed? Can, can you also just explain? Zhao Ziyang. Yeah, because so that's a the, very Zhao interesting Zhao was the party secretary from 1987 to 1989. He was the premier uh, from 1980 to 1987, maybe 88, yeah. So the, the question is, uh, so there was a conversation between Deng, 
Deng was politically conservative, economically liberal. Zhao Ziyang wasn't a political liberal at the beginning, but he recognized that without political reforms, it was more difficult for him to push forward economic reforms. So I don't think Zhao valued democracy as a as a as a as an end, but more as a instrument. What he cared about was economic reforms. He he didn't really care about multi-party democracy. Although he had more humanity in him, he refused to crack down on the on the students, and uh, which he paid dearly for politically. So so that conversation was really the boundary with which that you can go to implement economic reforms. Deng didn't agree with Zhao on that. He didn't see the connection the way that Zhao, Zhao saw the connection. And I think if Tiananmen didn't happen, um, I mean, this is a huge counterfactual, right? <laughs> if Tiananmen didn't happen, I think China would still be a autocracy, but it would be, first of all, economically, it would, it would be very, very different. Uh, in, I'm, I uh, published a book in 2008, and I'm now revising that book, and I go back to the data for the last 45 years. This is cap capitalism, capitalism with Chinese characteristics. And essentially, in the 1980s, for each percentage point of GDP growth, you get about uh, 1.36 percentage points of personal income growth. So, so that was a, a economic growth that benefited the average Chinese, many of them in the rural part of the country. In the 1990s, for each percentage point of the GDP growth, you get about 0.75 percentage points of the personal income growth. Right? So you go from 1.36 to uh, uh, 0 0.75. Um, and it, it was still benefiting, but it wasn't benefiting at the same rate as the previous growth model. I would imagine if the 1980s model prevailed, you wouldn't see so many fancy cities in China because the land rights would be more strong, benefiting the, the rural residents. They were talking about strengthening the land rights of the peasants. And let's be very clear, Chinese urbanization, industrialization, and a lot of the industrial policy program, a lot of the academic papers do not take into account the huge cost of land grants in the industrial policy program. If you go and open a R&D center in China, the government will give you that land. The government took that land from somebody. Mm. <laughs> so the government was not born with the land. It, it would take the land from somebody. So let me give you one piece of data. And when I, when I saw that data, I was shocked. In 2022, the last year we have this data, it's called the asset income. So we all have asset income, the interest payment you get from the bank account, the dividend, uh, uh, stock market returns. For average rural Chinese in 2022, his or her asset income for the whole year is 53 bucks. Okay. 53 bucks. All the urbanization, all this, the, 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 the aggregate land value of China is, um, is valued at 130 trillion US dollars. Um, and U.S. is about the same. Uh, Japan is about 60. Um, and India, the whole country of India is 40. Of this prosperity, urban prosperity, the rural Chinese get nothing, get nothing, because they don't have the land rights, right? So, but when you have stronger property rights, you're going to stop some products. Maybe Tesla will not be able to open the factory, right? So. So, so that will be the trade-off that I see. It will be an economy that, that is suffering less from all the imbalances. So if you look at the private consumption share as, um, 
uh, share of the GDP in the 1980s is about 51%. In the 1990s, it went down to 38, uh, to 42, and then uh, during Hu Jintao era, it was about 38. Now it's about 39, right? So a little bit up, 39. So it will be a more a domestic driven economy. It will be less export oriented. Um, it will be a political system that emphasizes rights a little bit more, maybe economic rights more than you know, political rights. It will, be tight, it will be a little bit like Taiwan you know, in the 1980s, a little bit like Korea. In, still pretty autocratic, pretty nasty, but it will not be like um, the, current, the current. I think in that system, academics would have quite a bit of freedom of uh, speech. Right? Maybe not the uh, yeah. average uh, people, right? So I, I see a huge difference. If Tiananmen didn't happen, that would be, uh, by the way, that would be a China that I like more, yeah. right? personally speaking. I think I hadn't realized that how, how much 1989 had sort of changed the trajectory that was happening and characters like Xiang were, yeah. were very reforming. So, so this is an unconventional view on my part. Uh -huh. okay. <clears throat> and uh, most people don't believe Tiananmen made an economic difference. Most people believe Tiananmen made a political difference. Mm. But I, you know, I'm, I go back to the data. So the reason why, let me say why people don't believe Tiananmen made an economic difference. They look at the GDP growth rate. Right. GDP growth rate didn't change. Right. Arguably, GDP growth rate trended up. But for each percentage growth of the GDP, you get less of a ban for the rural Chinese mm. than you did in the 1980s. To me, that's actually more important than GDP growth itself. Interesting. OK, next question, please. Hey, David. Um, thanks. This was great. So I, two questions, one contemporary policy and one historical. So the policy one is, um, if one is a hardliner or a semi-hardliner on China, which is sort of everybody in DC, <laughs> um, and your message is actually globalization is for China an even bigger aspect of their economic growth than people might expect, why doesn't that just fuel uh, you? Why shouldn't that fuel a US policy that is even more of a, a, a split so that, that's one question. And on the historical question, presumably there's, um, so it's interesting in the sense that, you know, a certain amount of fragmentation and chaos um, is helpful. Presumably there's a point at which sure. that goes the other direction. Yeah. Where's that balance point? How do you see that? But anyway, yeah. those are the two questions. Yeah, so, so let me go to the second question yeah. first, right? Um, exactly, it's, it's a trade-off, it's a balance. Um, and so in my, in my playbook, the Tang Dynasty is a nice balance. It is empire size uh, dynasty. It is not like the era between 220 and 580, mm -hmm. or fragmented little kingdoms here and there. And also there was a lot of killing, mm -hmm. a lot of violence, a lot of warfare among the kingdoms and within the, within the kingdoms. And also, um, Tang Dynasty is a unified empire, so Chinese like big empires, so I don't offend that sensitivity okay. when I advocate Tang Dynasty. But Tang Dynasty is also very open, very uh, cosmopolitan. Thousands of foreigners uh, lived in Chang'an, the capital city of uh, Tang Dynasty. Uh, uh, Tang, uh, uh, Tang Dynasty had a vibrant uh, Buddhism, Taoism and other uh, ideologies. Song Dynasty began to sort of unify the idea. So I would advocate, you know, if you if you like an empire, that's an empire mm -hmm. that, that 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 should be emulated. The U.S., you know, despite all the differences, is an empire-sized uh, country, right? So we we manage sometimes badly to keep it uh, unified and, and keep it on, on, on some sort of consensus, right? Although that's a very fragile one. Uh, India, um, so, so India, India is a remarkable country in the following sense. Um, it has incredible religious linguistic fragmentations. And the very fact 
that they can keep as a single country. Mm. That's actually remarkable, right? So it's, it's actually, and look at Czechoslovakia, a little country, they couldn't even keep it together. Look at Yugoslavia, a little country, they, can, they, they couldn't keep it together, right? For a massive country like India, with all these languages, with all these religions, a lot of Chinese trash India. And, but they don't understand the complexity of that country, right? China is ethnically, politically, ideologically, much more straightforward than India. That's an easier country to manage than, than a complex country like India. To, to go to your first question, I mean, you have a point there, but let me make two points. One is, you know, I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm academic. I'm not but, advocating yeah, that, but so, it's a question. No, yeah. but I'm academic, but I'm also Chinese, right? I don't like to see Chinese people suffer, so right. that's, uh, that's one reason. Right. And the other reason is, you know, uh, America has derived a lot of benefits from collaborations with China, right? The low cost financing, uh, the, uh, the goods and, and talents and, and all of that. By the way, uh, a lot of people now blame China for hoarding pandemic equipment and, and medical uh, wear. There's a paper put out by Peterson Institute of International Economics that shows that Trump's tariff war on China resulted in about 30 to 40 percent understocking of medical equipment. This is before pandemic. Right. So essentially hospitals in Massachusetts and elsewhere in 2020 were understocked with the medical wear in the first place. Mm. And then the pandemic happened. You need more the medical equipment. You need more medical wear. And we didn't have them. Part of it was the Trump's effect, right? right? Uh, so we can't, uh, 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 I, I just think that it's very important as a, as a, as a, you know, as a, as a community, as an academic, to lay out what the facts are, right? You know, I criticize China where in my book I was pretty blunt, but I don't believe that a lot of the facts that people believe to be true of China are actually true of China, right? So we need to look at these trade-off, and I, I, I support the tall, tall fence, small yard. Right. Where do you draw the line is a little bit tricky, mm -hmm. but that's much better than a blanket tariff war mm -hmm. on, on China. I think Biden administration has gotten many, many things right. Um, it's the Congress, as you know, David, right? It's the Congress that we often hear these um, these views, and it, also in the local legislature, right? Yeah. Banning Chinese from buying land. In Florida, they are banning Chinese from participating, Chinese students from participating in laboratories at the state universities. So, and, you know, arresting our colleague, uh, Gang Chen, right. right? So essentially sacrificing the civil rights, stopping Chinese scientists at the border, right? Uh, and it just, yeah. you know, we are violating basic rule of law and democratic principles in, in order to counter a exaggerated threat from China. That, that's my bottom line. Do you see any change Thanks. in that at all in, in Washington? Or do you? Or do you well, if Trump just... gets elected, <laughs> God forbid, <laughs> right? So, yeah, then, but there are so many other things that go wrong, so I don't even worry about this, <laughs> yeah. this one. Yeah. Um, OK, yeah, next so, question. Oh. oh, okay, maybe uh, I'll, I'll sign Very and then quickly. listen to yeah, the question. Ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned previously how um, the the Clinton administration, uh, Bush as well, uh, wanted to be able to get um, or incentivize uh, China to democratize. Uh, you also mentioned uh, previously how uh, China, in a way, uh, the scientists, for example, benefited from the academic freedom uh, in being able to, to be here in the U.S., uh, so that's, in a way, sort of like a service of the freedom that, that is granted uh, here in the U.S. Um, I guess with partly some of the attitudes uh, here in the U.S., uh, politicians, but also uh, from the non-zero instances of um, intellectual property being yeah. stolen and stuff like that, um, could you perhaps uh, strongman the argument in favor of uh, continuous investment in China over, say, for example, other countries like Japan, Vietnam, Mexico, yeah, so, so that's an investor business decision, and the investor business decision 
essentially make their decisions under a given policy environment. The discussion here is more about that policy environment, whether or not it should be one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So the IP uh, thefts and the other issues that you mentioned, those are serious issues. I'm not going to discount those issues. But these are um, economic, commercial issues, and they should be dealt with as economic and commercial issues. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, this is not what you hear in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., what you hear is that all of these things, right, IP things, uh, academic collaborations, buying land, uh, selling EVs, TikTok, all these things are components of a grand strategy for China mm -hmm. to undermine a, a, a Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. right? So that's a perspective I strongly disagree with. Mm -hmm. Taiwan, yes, I think that's a very serious issue. South China Sea, that's a very serious issue. But to portray everything else as a component of a grand strategy mm -hmm. against the United States, I just think that's, that's, a, that's there's, no, there's no strong support for that. Yeah. And that leads to very, very bad policies. For example, let, let me be very concrete. I believe that the Biden administration made a mistake earlier uh, earlier in its um, administration by not working more proactively to resolve trade issues with China. Mm. And I think there was a lost opportunity because a new government came in, right? Trump left, a new government came in, and you could reset the relationship. I'm not saying that you should you know, just get rid of it like that, but they should be more proactive in trying to resolve the tariff issues with the Chinese government. They didn't, they leave the Trump tariffs in place. Look at the United States now. You know, we have a above target inflation in, in 2020, 2021. Uh, the global supply chain was disrupted by the pandemic, which created the supply shocks, right? And then we didn't allow the Chinese goods to to come in, uh, because China had the, uh, in, before 2022, they had the production relatively normal, right? So they had, they had a lot of goods that they could, uh, they could uh, sell. And that fed into the inflationary pressures. You know, I'm not saying that inflation is all, all of that, but that was a big, probably a, a, a part of it, part of the picture, right? And now he's suffering from that because many people blame him for the, for the inflation. So I, I, I think, you know, you should, you should be, um, no, I don't see any, uh, any rationale to keep the Trump tariffs in place to deal with Taiwan issue, mm -hmm. to deal with South China. I just don't see any connections there, right? So those are economic issues. Those should be dealt with as economic issues. So I advocate the approach that compartmentalizes these issues. It's sort of what Biden is doing, especially recently. But I believe they arrived at that policy a little bit later than I wanted to see, and not as much as I wanted to see. I think it's pretty, it's pretty clear that completely decoupling would be harmful for the US as well, right? The Apple it would be terrible. Is, right. Yeah, it would be terrible for the US. Um, and it's going to uh, result in many, and, and decoupling, so we, we, in, in DC these days, they're not talking about decoupling in the sense that goods shouldn't come from China. They're talking about Chinese shouldn't come to America, right? right? right. So, so, so the Chinese entrepreneur shouldn't set up a factory in, in Texas, you know, to supply to, um, or to American uh, companies. And, and that's, just, that's, just, that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and so China now has this, world-class manufacturing base. But China didn't have that before. If you trace the history of Chinese manufacturing capacity, it was a result of Chinese entrepreneurs working with Taiwanese small and medium enterprises, with Koreans, with the Japanese, with the Taiwanese. They all needed help from other uh, economies. And US 
So for the U.S. CHIPS Act, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, to succeed on the schedule that, uh, that we want, you actually need help from China. Right, right. Right, but they don't want it. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna have to jump to the next question. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Yeah, I love your book. So um, my question is, um, it seems like the exam system when it was founded um, is the impetus for all of this. So I'm curious to hear, like, you know, if you look at China today, like, you know, the top Gaokao score usually, you know, isn't, you know, really admired in the village. And then Singapore, like, you know, the A-level score, right, is in the Straits Times and the Presidential Scholar. So like this Asian culture for like exam system, I think is the impetus for all this. So I'm curious to hear, like, you know, do you think like that can change somehow? Like, you know, the Asian culture obsession for like rankings and like, you know, placing, you know, doing well in exams, because that really is the impetus for like the lack of innovation and, you know, yeah. the autocracy. So, so I want to make a distinction between the exam system I look at okay. in my book and the exam system that, mm -hmm. that, that you are talking about, mm -hmm. the call call mm -hmm. and the A-level and all of that. Mm -hmm. The exam system I look at is a uh, supply chain to the entire political system, right? And it is the only way to gain upward mobility, right? Whereas the exam system you are talking about, you know, it is, it is a very important mechanism, mm -hmm. right? But there are other ways, right? So you can start a company, you mm -hmm. can also mm -hmm. leave China to come to MIT, to come to Harvard, to come to Stanford. So you, you don't have to be, um, uh, uh, enslaved to the Gaokao system if you have that freedom. Whereas the exam system I look at, people didn't have any of that mm -hmm, type mm -hmm. of freedom. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. only way to gain upward mobility mm -hmm. is taking the exam. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a good system. Mm -hmm. Whereas exam system can be a good complement to other things that, that we have in our system, right? Maybe the high school transcript, uh, your college essays, uh, you know, your, yeah, whatever the things that you did, the student clubs and, and all these other things, right? So what I object to is, is using the exam as a single mm -hmm. monopolistic mechanism to assess human capital, mm -hmm. to incubate mm -hmm. human capital. I don't object to it. Mm -hmm. I think colleges and universities were wrong in getting rid of the SAT. Well, I mean, the right? Ivy League is reinstating it, right? So, but but it would be wrong if they only have SAT, right? So that that's that's my that's my view, right? So as long as SAT it, SAT is a complement mm -hmm. to yeah. many other things, then then I have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so mm -hmm. next question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think this is going to be the last one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, but you know, if there's people behind me that could, I would just ask one for now. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one of the things I think you mentioned that was really interesting earlier was um, you were talking about how like China should give more credit to the private sector rather than the government in terms of a lot of uh, economic growth uh, and things like that. And that's really interesting because that really went against my intuition. And I'm curious. Um, so, like for example, one one example is that I think Chinese entrepreneurs especially let's say in real estate, were tremendously able to succeed because uh, China's interest rates were far lower than what they should have been. Like Evergrande was able to take uh, loans when they basically just had no assets to back up their loans, right? The, the, market, the, the market interest rate should have been much, much higher for them. Or like other examples is like the Chinese government inadvertently, I think, helped a lot of like internet technology companies such as like uh, Sina Weibo or... Um, or a, comp or a company like Baidu, for example, by banning foreign competitors in some sense for censorship reasons. And so, but you say in some sense, we should still thank the private sector. But I think the Chinese government put a lot of, you know, things in place that really tremendously benefit the private sector. And people would argue China in many ways is like more capitalist than the U.S. is. And I'm curious what your thoughts on that is. And like, what do you think there's something special about Chinese entrepreneurs that that I guess like if you put them in a different situation or if you take entrepreneurs from other countries to come to China, they would not have been as successful. Yeah, so, so we should make a sharp distinction between economic profits and financial profits. When Chinese government protected Baidu, uh, it protected and probably improved the financial 
profitability of Baidu, I would argue at the huge expense of the social welfare of the Chinese Jeez. society, yeah. right? And you know, Baidu is a terrible search engine. <laughs> it's a horrible search engine. Right? Not wrong, not wrong. And, and uh, why should I be limited to using a horrible search engine? That's a pure transfer from my unhappiness to the pockets of the investors and the operators of Baidu. Yes, the government helped Baidu at my expense. Yeah. I, I don't think that's a very good argument for uh, government uh, help. Let me make a distinction between Baidu and Huawei. Right? Huawei in its early days was actually discriminated against by the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. It was one of the private sector companies in the telecommunications sector, a sector that didn't allow private sector companies to come in. So Huawei went to Shenzhen. Huawei first began to produce its telecom equipment in Europe, in Africa, in Russia. Huawei succeeded outside of China, mm. outside of China. And then the government came in. So there's a, the sequential order matters because the government came in later to reward the success, established track record of success on the part of the Huawei, as opposed to government coming in before the company achieves the success. Usually those are not very, there are not that many good examples of, of those, right? So, so it's, it's very important to distinguish between uh, the um, kind of, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to sound like a economic ideologue, but, but I think there's some truth in market competition, which is that um, it benefits the comp companies, but also it should benefit the consumers and the customers. When the government in, in that type of system, I'm not saying government as a whole doesn't have a good role to play. But in that type of system, when everything else is also controlled by the government. Actually, when you talk about real estate companies, you didn't mention land. Mm. Yes, the government helped real estate companies by giving them cheap land. But this is the problem, right? So when you gave them cheap land, to you, when you buy a land, that's a cost. Mm -hmm. To you, the cost is low. But if I'm a rural Chinese, when I sell my land, the cost to you is income to me. So your low cost is my low income. <laughs> right? So then we have, a, we have to have a debate whether or not you should have an economic policy that sharply benefits the companies because of the low cost and disadvantages the rural Chinese. I would make an you know, economic argument as well as a social argument. It should not be like that, right? The rural Chinese are 80% of the Chinese population in the 1990s, 1980s. Now, depending on the definition you use, if you use the residency definition, it's about 40%. If you use the, um, the hukou definition, it's about uh, 60%. It is still a substantial part of the Chinese population. I would always argue for an economic policy that benefits the many people rather than the fewer people, right? So I think the real estate industry, everything else uh, being equal, has been terrible to the Chinese economy. Yeah. The high debt, the excess capacity, the Chinese uh, debt to GDP ratio is about 300%. It is hard for me to see why the real estate industry should have develop so fast, so disproportionately, in a country, that, by the way, that is land scarce. China is a big country, mm. but a lot of the Chinese land is, it cannot be used either for agriculture nor for, um, for inhabitation, right? So China is actually a very land intensive country. There's no e good economic reason to give the land free of charge for these uh, developers. And, and you know why they got the land uh, free of charge and low cost? Corruption. Mm. 
<laughs> right? Real estate is the most corrupt sector in the Chinese economy, right? So it, it's, it's not good for politics, it's not good for society. I don't think it's good for the economy. Yeah. Thank you, that was a great question. Yeah. I think we're gonna just try and squeeze in. Can we do two more? Okay, thanks. Hi, Professor Huang. Thank you so much for the book. Uh, so I'm actually conducting a dissertation research on the impact of the three-child policy, and I'm really interested in just the concept of human capital. And as we know, uh, a lot of countries in the world all face demogra demographic decline, but I know that China is has a specificity in terms of family planning because it had the very, very famous uh, one-child policy in the past. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, thinking about like the uh, China's success or its decline from the perspective of human uh, capital and um, like population dynamics. Okay. Thank you so much. So maybe we can combine the two questions. The second one. Oh, yeah. oh yes. Go ahead. Uh, you yeah. want to ask your question. Combine well. the two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I just come back from China and uh, left MIT along the 30 years after get my master's degree. Also, I met a beer in Shenzhen. Uh, before COVID-19. Uh, I think right now, uh, China is in worse situation. Uh, I don't know whether the fall is mean the failed. I just worry about China will be failed or fall in the near future. Failed and or, what did you say, failed or? A fall or failed, oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So the have... difference between the fall and the failed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also, uh, my question is, after 10 years, I come back to the United States, I feel, uh, you get get uh, get weak, or the system is in some uh, crazy. Yeah, for example, like a uh, president of Harvard and president of uh, UPenn resigned for the uh, politics problem. Okay, so that's, so that's, I think, that's, that's I, think I know it's a sensitive favorite, yeah. problem. Yeah. Okay. But uh, the the point I worry about is if if the United States is in uh, in mass, how the United States can help the world uh, see from the Russia and the uh, alliance. That's my point. So, wow. Okay. So I, to yeah, that. so let me answer the question in the reverse order. So I, I, I will not take the resignations of Harvard president, UPenn president as a indication of failure of the US and whatever, right? So yeah, they resigned, they resigned. That, who cares? And, <laughs> and so, but, but I think the more serious issue is, is academic freedom, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that's an issue that universities should discuss and, and debate, and I personally am worried about the tendency on the part of some universities to restrict a speech. I, I, I think that's that's very, very wrong. But who leads the university, I think that's a secondary issue. On your larger question about China failing and succeeding, the, I think the unfortunate thing is, you, you, you since you came back from China, you, 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 I, I, probably didn't hear you correctly. You, 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 maybe you said things are bad or things are good. I'm, I'm not quite Yeah, yeah, I feel it's very bad. Oh, very um, bad, okay. Yeah, very so, bad. So, all right, okay. I just want to check. I, so the, the um, um, I think the, the reason why I feel, uh, I agree with you, by the way. So, but, but the reason why I feel very sad about that is Chinese economy doesn't have to be bad. Mm. Right? So many people talk about Japan. But when Japan reached its peak, it was about 75% <clears throat> of the US per capita GDP. China is like 25%, 20% of the US per capita GDP. There's a lot of room to grow for China, yeah. whereas for Japan, you could argue the room to grow is, you know, there's still room to grow, but it's not as much as yeah. when the economy is 25% of the US GDP. So that's one. And the other is that unlike Japan, China has entrepreneurship, you mentioned that, uh, has really strong linkages between university and startup uh, culture, startup system. Uh, China has a vibrant, uh, had a vibrant uh, uh, venture capital uh, industry, mm -hmm. uh, PE industry, in a way Japan never had, right? In a way Japan, so the, the uh, Chinese are very innovative and very, very inventive. So there's no good economic reason why Chinese economy right. should slow down. Real estate problems and all of that, yes. But I think 
they are uh, they are solutions. They are solutions to these operational technical reasons, but they shouldn't really slow down the economy, right? So that's why I feel politics is extremely costly, mm -hmm. right? And it's really because it's purely because of politics. It's really no no. I can't think of one single reason why China cannot grow at a decent rate of the GDP growth uh, for the next 10 years and 20 years, right? So on the human capital, right? So maybe, let me be very quick. On the human capital, I, th I think China is facing demographic uh, issues. Um, that, that, that's true. But let me make two points. One quick point is that the bigger issue for China now is, is high youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. right? So the demographic challenge, that's going to bite sometime down the road. But the immediate problem is when the GDP slows down, you're going to have problems creating employment, employment for the young people. Young people have high aspirations and, and, and all of that. And also, the low demographic um, production is also going to change the consumption pattern, right? And it's going to change the savings rate. So in the medium term, it's going to change the savings rate, which is not going to be very good for the Chinese economic system. Chinese economic system is extremely capital intensive. It relies on high savings rate. When you have a very high dependency ratio, when you have a lot of old people, Old people earn little, spend more, so the savings rate is going to decline. So that's going to undercut that economic model. The, the, the third thing, let me end on this. The third thing is, this is the cost that China is paying for not having some free speech. Mm. Right? In 1957, a Peking University professor proposed to Chairman Mao to have moderate population controls, moderate, right? Maybe three children, two children. Chairman Mao said, rubbish, you know, we need people. Um, so the country didn't implement any population controls until 1978 when the country was facing, you know, this large population increase. And then they went in the other direction, only one child, right? And that one child policy went long after the utility of the policy. You know, you can check online. I advocated a long time ago to get rid of the policy. Many Chinese uh, academics advocated a long time ago to get rid of the policy, right? Long before it did in 2015. Now it was too late, mm -hmm. right? So this is the price you pay for autocracy. Because once you have an autocrat making up his mind, it's always hit his mind. <laughs> Making up his mind, then it's very difficult to change. And then you, you, when you change, it's usually too late. The pandemic control in 2022, exactly the same story, right? OK, so let me well, OK, well, so we're going to wrap up. Let's hope that your book is, uh, changes some minds in China and, and here. And, I doubt uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just um, let's give Yasheng a big round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.